Today we're going to go over a discussion of cast iron and the cast iron model that has been uh, implemented inside Design Life. So we'll start out with just a basic overview of cast irons, look at the uh, behavior of gray cast iron, and then how the downing model has taken that and basically implemented a strain life approach for that. We'll then just uh, touch on notch sensitivity because gray cast iron tends to be very notch insensitive, so uh, this correction actually is uh, important in the calculations. And because many of the applications for gray cast iron, tend, especially for powertrain, tend to be uh, long life situations, we'll uh, look at factor safety calculations as well because many times those are used along with uh, the fatigue calculation. And then finally look at the implementation inside design life. And at that point, we'll open it up for questions. Okay, <clears throat> looking at gray cast iron, it basically it's it's a ferrous metal. It it basically is composed of iron and then a fairly high percentage of carbon and silicon. One of the things you see is be, all cast irons have such a high carbon content that besides carbon in solution with the iron, there's always pockets of free graphite in the uh, material as well. In fact, it's actually the distribution and the shape um, of those uh, free graphite that basically describes the type of cast iron we're looking at. With gray cast iron, what we're looking at is the uh, free graphite being in flakes uh, mixed through the uh, thing. Cast iron tends to have a lot of very um, very good properties in terms of being an excellent casting material. It has a relatively low melting temperature compared to steels. It has very low shrinkage, so it, it basically uh, is an excellent casting material. Uh, the graphite in it actually makes it, one, it's easy to machine. It also has got good wear uh, capabilities because of the graphite. Um, it has very high compressive strength. Um, it's got very good uh, uh, thermal conductivity, uh, good vibration uh, uh, damping properties, and relatively low cost. On the downside, it's got a low tensile strength and it has very, very uh, low uh, ductility, so it's a very brittle material. The other thing to mention is when we look at uh, uh, gray cast irons is they're graded based on uh, their tensile strength, but also they're uh, graded based on the size of the specimen. The uh, specimen size influences uh, the fatigue, fatigue behavior. Looking at the overall behavior, uh, what we were looking at here are monotonic uh, stress drain curves, uh, the red in compression, uh, the blue in tension. And you'll see one of the <clears throat> big attributes uh, for gray iron is the fact that the compressive strength and stiffness are substantially higher than the tensile. Uh, a second thing is there's virtually no linear portion of the uh, stress strain curve. It is basically not linear from the uh, onset. Uh, it has a very asymmetric behavior, tension versus compression, due to the uh, graphite flakes. The uh, graphite is extremely weak in tension, though it's almost incompressible in compression. And so we see a, a huge uh, change in the response. Another thing that we see with uh, gray uh, cast iron is the fact that the, uh, again, the flake, the flake uh, graphite tends to promote uh, cracking and debonding along the surface. Those are all attributes that uh, Downing was looking at when he was trying to formulate uh, the uh, cast iron model that we're using his model today uh, inside Design Life. And the first challenge he had was to try to characterize just those monotonic curves, the tension and compression. And 
what he utilized was this concept of a uh, secant modulus. A secant modulus is nothing more than generating a modulus from the origin out to a point on the SN curve. And so at each one of these stress locations, you can go off and basically calculate what the secant modulus is. And again, we're going to have a series of moduli for tension. We'll have a second set for compression because they are different. And what you'll see looking at the secant modulus is that we end up with a relatively linear behavior of the secant modulus with respect to stress. So what we're looking at in the top graph, each of those uh, blue dots are a calculation from the test of the secant modulus. And the red line is just a linear regression through that data. With that regression, you can see that you have a fairly good fit. And it's very easy to go off and basically come up with a relationship that specifies the secant modulus with respect to the uh, tangent modulus at zero stress and then the slope of the regression. Once I have a modulus, I can calculate the strains. So I take the stress divided by that secant modulus, and I now have uh, strain values. But we'll see looking at the high stress regime of that curve that the test data starts to deviate from that linear fit. So what Downing did was calculate the strains, one from the secant modulus, the other from the actual measured strains from the tests, and he called that a remaining strain. So it's just basically the test data strain minus the one from the secant modulus, and that remaining strain plotted against um, stress you can go off and do a power law fit and come up again with a, a linear regression a power law fit. And uh, Downing actually utilized the ramberg osgood equation, which is nothing more than what we use for standard strain life plasticity. So basically, he, the fit he's doing for that remaining strain fits right into the uh, uh, ramberg osgood uh, relationship. With those two, he's able to characterize the uh, shape of the monotonic curves. So he has a set of properties for uh, compression, and he has a second set for tension. Now, if you go off and start counting here, you'll see just to go off and characterize these two curves, we now have seven sets of, we have seven properties involved. We have the uh, tangent modulus, and then we have basically the secant uh, slope as well as the uh, fit for ramberg osgood one set for compression, a second set for tension. And these by themselves aren't even enough to go off and characterize the behavior of the gray iron. There is an additional uh, issue with gray iron, and that is this cracking that happens at the surface. Uh, as you look at the behavior of these specimens with higher and higher applied loads, you'll see that the surface cracking goes off and starts to uh, change the unloading modulus. So as I go up to a particular stress level and start to unload, that slope changes with uh, the uh, peak stress that was applied. Uh, again, looking at this uh, unloading modulus uh, through a series of tests applied with different levels of stress, you s he recognized that it was basically kind of a linear fit with the peak stress applied to that loading. And so he's able to go in and basically fit the unloading modulus with peak stress and again come up with a linear regression that describes that unloading modulus as the uh, initial tension modulus, which again had uh, uh, a zero stress applied, and then a slope that is <clears throat> applied to the max stress in the cycle. Now, one thing you'll see is that E0, that uh, tangent modulus, is common across the, the secant uh, representations for both tension and compression as well as this unloading modulus. With these 
nine parameters, he's able to describe the uh, monotonic behavior, but that's not really what we need to do to uh, go in and calculate the cyclic behavior. Now, I'm not going to go through all the uh, uh, actual equations, but the process he used actually was rather uh, ingenious. What we're looking at here is basically a loading, unloading uh, representation in terms of stress and strain. And the black trace represents the actual cast iron hysteresis loop. And again, you can see immediately how asymmetric it is, the fact that uh, it is uh, much uh, stronger in, uh, it's different in uh, compression than it is in tension. What Downing did was to take that and actually break it into several components. The first component he uh, describes is looking at this hysteresis loop. He, he basically recognized that the height uh, of going from the unloading curve to the loading curve across this hysteresis loop actually was symmetric. And so he, he basically decided he did not have to go in and have this asymmetric behavior. He started out with a hysteresis curve that was symmetric. He's gone in and generated a new definition for this cyclic behavior. It uses exactly the same equation format that we saw for the monotonic. Uh, but now it's describing the hysteresis behavior in terms of a symmetric loop. This is actually very important because now it allows us to go off and use just standard procedures that we use for standard uh, metals to go off and do our stress strain tracking. We're used going off and doing a massing hypothesis just like we do for any other metal uh, when we go off and do strain life. In addition, he then started to describe what generated the asymmetry in the uh, cyclic behavior. And the first correction he made was, he calls it for the graphite response. Again, the gray cast iron is a uh, heterogeneous mixture of iron and these flakes of pure graphite. And these graphite flakes tend to be very, very weak in tension but they're actually almost incompressible. So in compression, they basically uh, apply the full loading uh, to the part. What he's done is generate this blue curve here, and this curve represents the stress that the graphite adds to the uh, um, compressive behavior due to, the, due to its incompressibility. And so you'll see that this graphite correction basically is tension is completely zero, assuming that it's so much, the tension uh, stiffness is so much less, and strength is so much less than the uh, iron. Uh, but as you go into compression, it basically adds additional stiff stress to the uh, stress strain response. In addition to that, he also recognized that the fact that we have these surface cracks, we actually have these cracks open up in uh, tension and close in compression. So he also has a crack closure response that he calculates. Now, all these properties, we're, we're basically looking at stresses due to graphite, stresses due to crack closure, uh, stress-strain relationship for this bulk material, this symmetric material. These all are computed from his monotonic properties. So it's the monotonic properties that are important in terms of our physical tests. Uh, but when we're done with these, uh, internally in the software, we're able to come up with a stress-strain relationship that basically describes the, uh, the asymmetric st cyclic stress-strain behavior. <clears throat> This is uh, very clever in the fact that we're actually able to use standard procedures to go off and cycle count the uh, hysteresis loop. And then the corrections that we have, both for the graphite as well as the clack closure, are now corrections purely on stress level. So everything is very straightforward in, in terms of uh, generating the cycles. Once we have the cycles, now 
uh, we have to uh, look at the uh, the damage parameter, and the damage parameter that Downing chose was uh, basically just a Smith Watson Topper uh, uh, parameter. However, uh, unlike the Smith Watson Topper that we typically use for the alloys, uh, the gray cast iron actually uh, fit within a, a single line. The standard Smith Watson topper both has an elastic and plastic component, and here we're uh, using just a single component for that. And so the uh, uh, curves are basically just linear regressions of the uh, uh, fatigue tests, basically constant amplitude uh, loading at different load levels, and we're able to go off and characterize a uh, – an intercept and a slope to the Smith Watson topper curve. So now we actually have a cyclic response, we have a way to actually count the cycles, and we have a damage curve to go off and apply it to. <clears throat> so what we're looking at now is the properties that go into, in this case, design life, but they're, again, they're the properties that would drive the downing model. And the first three are just basically uh, uh, standard uh, properties, and these properties for the first three really are representative of the fatigue properties, of the, the uh, uh, constitutive properties that are put into the fine element analysis. So when we have this Young's modulus here, this is nothing more than the modulus was used in the FE analysis, and that and the Poisson's ratio are brought into design life simply so we could jump between stress and strain from a linear analysis. The actual properties for downing start, and these are the properties that we saw uh, early on with the stress strain curves, the fact that we have six sets of properties that describe the curve behavior in terms of compression and tension, the secant uh, modulus as well as the uh, um, ramberg osgood uh, fit. There's the uh, tangent modulus. Again, this is actually the intercept that's used for both the tension compression as well as the unloading uh, curve. And then it's followed with uh, KS and NS, which are the uh, coefficient and the exponent on the uh, Smith Watson topper damage parameter. So those are the, and again, these properties can all be deduced from uh, monotonic uh, tension and compression behavior. And then the uh, Fatigue tests, again, constant amplitude fatigue tests, allow us to get the unloading modulus as well as the uh, Smith Watson topper parameters. Mm. On the left hand side is a uh, listing out of the, uh, um, the um, ENCODE database of uh, great cast irons that we have available that are. Uh, inputs to the Downing model, and these actually came from the American Foundry Society. Uh, they presented, provided us with the uh, Downing model parameters for uh, these various uh, gray irons. And as I had mentioned earlier, the gray iron is typically characterized as a, uh, a tensile uh, strength in terms of KSI, so 20, 25, 30 basically represent uh, the tensile strength in KSI as well as well as a, a specimen size. The uh, fatigue properties are sensitive to the size of the specimen that's cast, and so you typically go off and get your fatigue properties from specimens that represent the relative uh, thickness of the castings that you're using. So, <clears throat> That's basically the outline of the Downing model that represents the gray cast iron. Um, we're now going to go off and take a quick look at notch sensitivity. And the reason for this is gray cast iron tends to be very notch insensitive. What that means is if I were to go off and do a fatigue test of a smooth specimen, I could generate a curve that represents the fatigue behavior with no notches. If I then go in and take that material property and I apply to it the stress concentration from my final model, a notch, a hole, 
a fillet radius, and I predict the fatigue behavior using that unnotched fatigue curve and the stress concentration from the geometry, I would generate a prediction, as we see down here, this dashed line. In real life, if I went in and created a fatigue specimen with a notch in it, and I generated the uh, fatigue curve from that notch specimen, with notch insensitive materials, you'll see the fatigue performance is better. That is to the fact that some materials tend not to be sensitive to the stress risers in the geometry, hence notch insensitivity. This is uh, attributes that were recognized back, oh, 80 years ago in the 30s, and there were a variety of approaches to go in and try to account for this material behavior of notch insensitivity. Um, there was an ACM spec that actually defined notch sensitivity as this Q, and at the time, they basically made it a relationship of the notch fatigue strength, which is that KF, and the stre actual stress concentration factor, the last stress concentration factor, factor coming out of uh, a textbook or out of the FE code. Um, the reason I was actually showing this, well, two, two. One, this notch sensitivity, the way it's defined, makes it very difficult to use today in finite element analyses. And that's because in order to calculate the notch factor, KF, I need to know the stress concentration factor. And that's typically something we don't really know coming out of our FE results. Uh, we know what KT stress is, but we don't know what KT is typically. So the notch sensitivity tends to be difficult to apply to an FE model. But the other thing I wanted to just point out is when we look at notch sensitivity, uh, these are two different empirical approaches to uh, uh, estimate it. Um, they're functions of two things. They're one, a material parameter, this uh, Rho or this alpha is a material property that describes a material's notch sensitivity. And again, as I said, gray iron tends to be very notch insensitive. But this also has got this R. This R is the radius of the notch. And what this is really describing is the size of the notch or the sharpness of the notch. Uh, and the uh, smaller the notch, the sharper the notch, the less impact it has on fatigue. So what we have in design life is an approach that uh, we obtained from the FKM fatigue guidelines that goes off and estimates the notch sensitivity or the correction for notch sensitivity uh, with two steps. The first step is when we calculate the stresses from our FE model, and that would be the blue surface here is like the surface of my part. All along that surface, I am recovering the stresses from the finite element. In addition, what we do is we calculate the stress gradient. And what that actually is, is how quickly the stress drops off as I go into my part. So as I travel into my part, the stress drops, starts to drop off. That drop off is a function of the radius of the notch. And so I can go in and estimate at a given distance what the drop off in stress is and from that calculate a stress gradient. That stress gradient now is really that component describing the geometry, the R in the parameters that Neuber or Peterson had for notch sensitivity. It tells me what the, uh, the relative uh, size of the notch is. And then built into design life, we have a whole series of equations that are functions of different materials. So we have equations in design life that deal with steels and cast irons so as one great cast iron we're talking about here, and aluminum, cast aluminums. And what these curves are, they're a function of material type as well as the uh, UTS values. And we use the, the two, the material type and the UTS value to characterize a materials and then these curves, basically, the horizontal axis is the stress gradient. And then the vertical axis is actually 
a reduction in the effect of stress for fatigue. So we're able to go off, calculate what the stress gradient is, and again, that happens automatically in the translation, go up to our particular material curve, and actually, for gray cast iron, uh, these are German designations, GG is gray cast iron, and it comes over and specifies reduction in the stresses that we calculated for finite element to go off and do our fatigue calculation. And you'll see, especially for gray cast iron, that these corrections are relatively high. So, so basically, I'm cutting my stress level, in, in this case, a factor of two, uh, that we use for my fatigue calculation. If you just go back and think for uh, simple materials on how we estimate uh, fatigue curves off UTS, uh, uh, a very popular uh, methodology says that at uh, UTS, I fail in one cycle, my fatigue limit, infinite life, is half UTS. So a factor of two took me from infinite life to failure at one cycle. So you can you see the impact of uh, these uh, large reductions in stress on our uh, fatigueers and why we need to do uh, notch sensitivity calculations uh, with gray iron just to make uh, useful information out of it. Again, as I mentioned, uh, uh, a lot of the components, especially in powertrain, uh, that we see using uh, gray cast iron tend to be at very long lives. Again, gray cast iron isn't that ductile. It's not that friendly to uh, large uh, tensile loads, and so uh, we, we see it used many places where it's on high cycle fatigue. And many times when we're looking at that, we tend to, uh, besides looking at fatigue life, many times we look at factors of safety. So just, I'm just going to cover factors of safety here very quickly. And factors of safety, if you can calculate it in a variety of techniques, and uh, some of them uh, are very simplified, such that I go off and I look at my monotonic properties, UTS, yield, and I come up with a fraction of that that I say if I never exceed, I have uh, an appreciable factor of safety. Um, there are extensions to that where instead of looking at monotonic properties, I actually go off and I recover fatigue properties that give me my fatigue limit. So now the stress level I'm using actually is based on fatigue tests versus just monotonic properties. Um, again, that would be looking at just the amplitude of the cycle. Um, there are extensions to that where now we look at things that are constant life diagrams. A Hague diagram is nothing more than a constant life diagram. And now this constant life diagram is described in terms of mean stress as well as the stress amplitude. And we can go in and look at our stress state and look at our stress state with respect to the curve and from those calculate a uh, factor of safety. Now all of these are looking at either constant amplitude or maximum cycle in your history. Um, another approach and much more sophisticated approach is where we go in and we look at the actual load history applied to the part and we calculate accumulated damage from that entire load history and then we come back and get a, a factor of safety that would be a reduction or an increase on that applied load history to give us a target life. We're going to go off and look at these last two here. One where we're using constant life diagrams to uh, estimate a stress-based uh, factor of safety, but looking at the full stress state in terms of amplitude and mean, as well as uh, accumulated damage. <clears throat> and so, in terms of a stress-based uh, factor of safety, what we start out with is a constant lifeline. In this case here, we have a very simple one that's Goodman, uh, where I have basically going from my fatigue limit down to UTS, I've described my constant lifeline as straight, but this could be uh, uh, 
any curve or a series of uh, piecewise fits uh, with a more complex constant lifeline. And this represents basically the threshold where if I'm below that, I'm safe. If I'm above it, I fail. And then below this, again, I have a stress state. Again, my horizontal axis is the mean stress of my cycle. The vertical axis is the uh, stress amplitude of my cycle. And so this right here is my stress state in terms of amplitude and mean. And we can go in and calculate factors of safety off of this. And there's two different ways to uh, view this. One is where the mean stress is generated by the applied loading. So as I increase the loading, my mean stress increases along with my uh, amplitude. We call this constant R ratio, basically the min and max of the uh, um, uh, um, excuse me, the min and max of the cycle actually are proportional. And so what we do here now is look at the relative distances between the origin and my stress state and the origin where I intercept the uh, constant lifeline, and that ratio is a factor of safety. So basically, if that ratio is above one, I pass. If it's below one, I failed in terms of whatever target life I'm looking at. There's another way to view this, and that's where my mean stress isn't really a function of loading. It's basically a constant. And so my mean stress is due to, let's say, some sort of uh, uh, assembly process, a bolt-up condition, uh, uh, pre -stress, some sort of uh, pre-stress due to an insertion of one part into another. But it's, it's a mean stress that's basically constant, independent of the loading that I apply. And so now what we do <clears throat> is we uh, look at basically the increase in uh, amplitude and the mean stays constant, and we look at the ratios of the stress state there. And so within design life, you can go off and do these simple calculations where we'll look at a uh, load history, find the worst cycle in that, and come back and give you just a stress-based factor of safety, either constant uh, R ratio, constant mean. A much more sophisticated approach that goes off and looks at the impact of the entire time history uh, is ba we call it a, a life-based factor of safety or uh, cumulative damage factor of safety. And what we're going to do here is we're going to actually go off and do our fatigue calculation, and we're going to give the calculation a target life. So I'm interested in my life at a million cycles or 10 million cycles. And what the program's going to do is basically iterate on that fatigue calculation and keep adjusting the level of the load. It's going to put a scale factor on the load history, and it's going to calculate that scale factor that forces, for this location, the life to be my target life, a million or 10 million. That factor of safety is uh, basically uh, identical to this constant R ratio factor safety if I had a constant amplitude load. So what it's calculating is this basically uh, constant R ratio factor safety, but it's doing it on uh, the full time history, not on a, the worst cycle or on a uh, single cycle. So if I look at my standard fatigue calculation here, what I have is a load history. That load history gets rainflow counted, and it generates a series of cycles, stresses or strains, depending on whether I'm looking at uh, stress life or strain life. <clears throat> Those cycles get compared against an actual fatigue curve, and each cycle generates an increment of damage, we sum up those damages, we can calculate the life for our input loading. So what I can do now is start to give it a target life that I want to have, and then go through an iterative process where we start adjusting the load history here, trying to adjust the load history to achieve our target life.
So when we're done, whoops, <clears throat> we have an input load, a scale factor on our input load history that achieves our target life. And again, that scale factor is basically the factor, of the constant R ratio factor of safety. But now it's looking at the whole accumulated damage rather than just a single cycle. And it gives me a, a, a way to go off, especially when I'm looking at very high lives, to go in and give me a, a kind of a confidence level on uh, what kind of uh, uh, increase or decrease would I uh, have on my load history to uh, achieve that uh, target life. Uh, finally, so we've we've looked at the aspects of gray cast iron. We've looked at the Downing model, which is specifically uh, formulated to uh, represent the uh, fatigue behavior of the gray cast iron. Uh, we looked at notch sensitivity because, again, almost all these calculations we're going to need to implement uh, notch sensitivity corrections to allow us to get reasonable answers uh, out of the uh, solution. And uh, we've we've seen uh, factors of safety. Um, what we have is those implemented in design life off of FE results. So uh, at 12.1, uh, the gray cast iron model was added as just a standard option for strain life. So now under strain life, besides the standard uh, equations, you can go off and invoke the uh, downing gray cast iron. And when you look at the uh, downing model, it uh, deals with mean stresses implicitly because it's using a Smith-Watson topper um, damage curve, so the mean stresses come out of that directly. Um, it's got the ability to invoke uh, not sensitivity corrections, and again, in today's uh, current implementation with Design Life, that's uh, utilizing uh, the uh, FKM um, method based off stress gradients. However, uh, in July we'll be releasing a next version of Design Life 13.1, and there we've actually implemented the critical distance approach as well. Um, it allows you to go off and do the back calcs inside of the engine to uh, calculate these commu uh, cumulative uh, factor of safety calculations, and again, that's uh, very typical for these long life situations. And uh, the model supports all the time-based load providers we have, uh, constant amplitude, time series, time step. In addition, the database, the standard database for design life, uh, the ENCO database actually, uh, has the uh, American Foundry Society uh, uh, models for the uh, Downing model for uh, uh, a series of eight different uh, great cast irons built in. Here, let me just go off and give you kind of a tour through the, uh, what I'm going to do is look at a very simple uh, uh, model here. And what this actually is, uh, is a simplified uh, four-cylinder engine. And what I have for that is uh, a four-step loading, which is basically the firing cycle for the four cylinders. So basically what I'm going to be importing into the analysis is uh, uh, four analyses, uh, uh, four steps out of uh, my uh, final solution that is the firing order for the uh, engine. So I have that engine model uh, inside of design life, and if I were to look again, what I have here are uh, four sets of stresses, one for each of the firing loads, uh, and I'm going to bring these in as a time step load provider. So I'm just going to kind of play through these as if, as if they're a history, which they are. Um, I have uh, material properties assigned here that are coming out of the uh, ENCO database, and again, these are the gray irons that came from the uh, American Foundry Society uh, material database. And so inside of these, again, you're going to have all the parameters that described the uh, monotonic behavior of the gray cast iron, the unloading modulus, as well as the uh, Smith-Watson topper parameters. And those 
are uh, employed by the Downing model to go off and do the stress drain tracking, count the cycles, and use the uh, smith watson Tupper fatigue curve. In addition, we have the ability to go off and uh, to uh, uh, invoke, again, the notch sensitivity uh, corrections as well as uh, doing the factor safety. Uh, this particular analysis actually runs in about a minute and a half, but I'm not going to make you sit here and make me make up uh, words for a minute and a half while it runs. Uh, but it's going through uh, about a quarter of a million nodes to uh, do the calculation. Again, what comes out of this is just the standard strain life properties that we would see, things like life, damage, uh, stress levels, and these are uh, post neuber uh, uh, stress levels. Again, the fact that there's a uh, a nonlinear portion, the Ramberg Osgood portion of the uh, uh, stress, the uh, cyclic stress strain curve, uh, we're going through a, a Neuber correction with that. So we have uh, access to uh, all of this uh, information. Let's just do max stresses here real quickly. So you can go off and tear it, get uh, full field uh, results coming out of the uh, uh, design life and process it the same way you would process uh, any of the uh, uh, standard uh, metal uh, definitions, things like steels or aluminums. <laughs>